Like the system of drains and aqueducts that furnished ancient Rome with water and conveyed its waste to the river Tiber, an even more ancient and elaborate system of fluid nourishment and drainage exists within our bodies as part of the lymphatics. While the nutrient circulation, waste drainage, and immune function of the body lymphatics have been understood for some time, lymphatics of the brain are a new discovery, and how by their free fluid flow they might shield against Alzheimer's disease, we stand just at the threshold of uncovering. Dr. Gerald Lamole enlightened to the import of the lymphatics in the earliest days of heart transplant surgery in America. When the first round of successful transplant patients all died within two years, his investigation found a failure of lymphatics to be the reason. Today, he joins Vital Signs to introduce lymphatics of the brain and to highlight how we might nurture lymphatic flow for our optimum health. Welcome to Vital Signs, where we learn how to get healthy from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Fallon. Dr. Lamole, fantastic to have you join us on Vital Signs again. Well, thank you, Brendan. It's a pleasure being with you again. First of all, uh, you, you call the lymphatic system the secret river of life. What do you mean by that? Well, over the years, it hasn't been regarded as anything significant. It never, as a system, it's never been looked at like the other systems. And yet it interfaces with every organ in our body, indeed every cell of our body, the lymphatic system touches. It has more volume, fluid volume, than the blood system itself yet you can't see it. People don't recognize it. In, in medical school, it's really not acknowledged in relationship to the terrific work it does. In a nutshell, could you explain what it does? Well, the, the lymphatic system is basically the clearance system of our, our body. It's like the, you know, the waste products we have in our garbage and our cans and get them cleaned up every day or when they get picked up by the uh, people in the sanitation department. It's the same thing with the lymphatics. The lymphatics take away toxins from and poisons that are in the local tissue. And something else, it's also the home of the immune system. So the immune cells and the, the chemicals and proteins that are moderated by the immune system are sent through the lymphatics to the areas where they're necessary. So it does so many things that are unrecognized in our society. And I understand that it's only fairly recently that the lymphatic flow is thought to be relevant to brain health and brain function. What has brought this understanding about? Well, we always thought that through diffusion, somehow the toxic substances in the brain disappeared and, and the brain was unique. It didn't have a lymph clearance. About 12 years ago, uh, in the um, laboratory, University of Rochester, uh, Nettergaard, my Nettergaard, and her team showed evidence that actually there was a clearance of the brain by way of lymph-like system by the lymphatics that they just discovered about two or three or four years ago that actually are in the space underneath the dura mater in the brain. And these lymphatics actually pick up the proteins and the particles from the extracellular fluid and carry it down to the deep cervical lymph vessels to be dumped into the blood system to be cleared by the liver. Dr. Lamol will talk about the links between lymphatic flow, inflammation, and Alzheimer's in just a moment. But first, here's a look at our earlier interview on lymphatics and heart health. If the cholesterol stays in the tissue a long time and it is not taken care of quickly, I mean, you're going to get an inflammatory reaction. Pharmaceutical companies came up with medication that reduced the cholesterol levels real low. But what if there's a key piece missing from this equation? A bodily system, in fact, that can be leveraged to bring a more natural solution to heart disease. We noticed that there were these little white streaks, so we biopsied those streaks, and sure enough, they were scarred up lymphatic vessels. Working in connection with our nerves, veins, and arteries is our lymphatic system. What role does it play in preventing not just heart disease, but chronic disease in general? And how can we leverage it to optimize our health and longevity? You can view that video after by clicking the link in the description below. And if you haven't already, subscribe just by clicking the button below to access these and more cutting-edge vital signs and Epoch TV health content. 
What kind of evidence is coming through of lymphatics in operation in the brain? Actually, and John Kepnes from Washington University have shown these particles where they inject these particles in the brain of laboratory animals, and they can follow them through the lymphatics of the brain of the dura mater area, and they can follow them down into the deep cervical and then into, into the uh, venous system. So it's pretty uh, impressive the connection between the glymphatics clearance of the brain into the lymphatic system of the body. And the, why it's called glymphatic is because it takes the glial cells of the brain to hap make this happen. So what happens, the glial cells actually shrink to make more space in the brain for the fluid, the CNS, the cerebrospinal fluid that comes in. So they shrink down and they create the aquaporin-4. And what it is, is it basically it's these molecular channels that are formed in the foot pads of the glial cells. So the fluid can actually run through. It's like a tunnel that the fluid runs through. So in comes cerebrospinal fluid and creates a convection current that sweeps all the toxic fluids away from one side of the brain to the other. And then it's picked up on the opposite side of the brain and carried away from the by the perivascular venous areas. It doesn't go directly into the vein at that point. What happens is it's carried along in a tube outside the venous vessels. And I understand it's a specific type of glial cell, the astrocyte, through which these acroporin tubules are formed. If you call them glial cells, that may be confusing because there are astrocytes, branch of the glial cells. What kind of signs are coming through that these aquaporin tubules, a problem with them or they're being malformed would lead to cognitive decline? Well, there's hereditary diseases that the aquaporin tubules, they don't make enough of them or they put them in the wrong place. And those people get dementia. The uh, aquaporin-4, which is the protein that allows this restructuring, a tubular restructuring of the pod of the astrocyte. They have to be at the foot as the astrocyte encircles the arterial capillary. The aquaporin-4 tubules occur in that foot pad so that the fluid can go from the CSF out into the interstitium. In this congenital disease, these are either absent, the aquaporin-4 gene is either absent or it cr makes the aquaporin tubules away from where they can be ejected. It's like if you have a, a faucet that is going into a sink, if the faucet is outside the sink and you turn it on, the water is going to go the wrong way and it's not going to produce the effect you want it to. So when the aquaporin is either absent or the tubule uh, structure is misplaced, then the, these people do not get the convection flow, the flow that pushes everything through there, and they get dementia. This sounds like a, a very useful sample, Dr. Lamol, of people who don't have the aquaporin tubes or don't have them formed correctly to show what happens when that factor isn't there. But there's a, a general population of people who don't have this specific genetic condition, and many of which are, are getting Alzheimer's, how could glymphatic flow uh, factor in to their Alzheimer's? So you have a space between the astrocyte, which encircles the vessel, and the vessel itself. Between those two is a space where the cerebrospinal fluid flows. And in that space, what happens is when that aquaporin is effective, the CSF flushes through there, and the convection current carries it to the other side where it's picked up by the, the same setup on a venous level, a perivenous rather than periarterial. The convection current going from the arterial side to the venous side is what sweeps away all the toxins. When that current is interrupted by these bundles of amyloid beta or the tau protein or uh, synuclein proteins, what happens is that convection current is interrupted and the toxins don't clear out of there. You mentioned uh, amyloid 
proteins and, and tau particles, what, what are they exactly? The amyloids are actually proteins that are created to defend against inflammation. So amyloid beta is a, a defense mechanism of the brain against inflammation. And what happens is as amyloid beta builds up, if it's not cleared, it becomes toxic. It bundles and blocks the clear flow and the convection of the extracellular fluid to sweep to the venous side and clear the brain of toxic substances. It's the amyloid alpha that is involved with increasing synapses, uh, synaptic activity exactly. in the brain. Okay. Yeah. What the beta is, is anti-inflammatory. So if you don't have any inflammation, you're not going to create beta. You're going to create amyloid alpha. So if you have generally low brain inflammation, then you won't be producing so many of the amyloid beta particles and there won't be so much to obstruct the glymphatic flow and, and drain toxins from the brain, as I understand. Right. Instead, if you have no inflammation there, your brain produces amyloid alpha, which then creates more synapses and more neuron growth factor. Excellent. That's your ideal situation. Yes, that's right. So it behooves us to decrease the inflammation in our body as a general inflammation and as local inflammation so that the brain doesn't produce the amyloid beta that it needs to counteract that inflammation.